I can remember the first day I went on, and I was scared stiff, I'll tell you, absolutely scared stiff, man. It's the first time I went on, you know, the noises and stuff, and um, I was only, you know, like 19 or something like that. But the cold face is like um, a long bank of, like, machines, individual machines, they are, and they support the roof, so they, they work by hydraulic. So um, each worker, you know, would have a bank of like 20 of these machines to to operate. As the coal, you know, as the, as the machines cut the, you know, the, um, the coal, the you'd have to advance everything to get to the next cut. I mean, on the ground, it was just like a little city. There were garages and repair shops, electrician shops. Mechanical engineers, mm -hmm. underground shops, local sheds. It was good, and everyone was lit up with fluorescent lights. And uh, you could drive a bus through it, wasn't it? That bit. And in fact, on one occasion, this happened, and I was um, buried up to my waist, and there was no one had any spades to dig me out. So there was only two feet of dirt to fall, and it was all broken up, but I couldn't move because it was up to my waist. And a Wigan lad, a great big lad, came to me and he put his arms round me and heaved me out of it. Because all the time the pit is groaning. And you can, you can feel the movement down below. And my dad, they said, he used to, they used to love working with my father because he'd say, right, out now! And everybody would shoot like mad out. And then at two minutes afterwards you got a fall. There was a lot of people I found out years afterwards. They thought my father was a god. He could read the pit. It was like talking to him. And that's what they said. The pit talked to him. And that's why they liked working with my father. Before you went down the pit, you had to get tallies, two tallies. You used to give one to the guy that was going down in the cage. You give him one and you keep one for yourself. And when you got back up the pit, you know, you'd give the tally back to him. So um, they knew you wasn't down pit, like, you know what I mean? Because if that tally was missing, then they'd presume that you were still down there and they'd have to send someone to search for you, you know? Health and safety was important. There was a lot of laws, you, you know, I mean, you could get fined for doing things that were against safety and regulations. One of the, th the things we used to do was ride on conveyor belts. Because, you know, the, the distances sometimes like to walk quite quite long, you know what I mean? And it was pretty odd. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to do. Some you could do. Some, you know, like, some were called man riders. So you could actually jump on them, but there's some you, you're not supposed to do. And if you got caught, you'd just accept a fine and your wages. I was 15 years of age, just left school. And I haven't told my mum and dad why I was going to look for a job. I went there and the guy said, come back tomorrow morning and we'll give you a medical. So I was there nice and bright and early and uh, sat in this room and next minute the door opened. My father walked in, grabbed me by the collar and he gave me a belt in. Don't forget in them days, a lot of people died on the pit. There weren't a lot of safety conscious people working at that time in the 1960s. And my dad had been in quite a lot of accidents and been trapped down the pit. I mean, my father's back was covered in big blue scars all over his back and his arms. He'd done 49 years down the pit, my dad. But actually, during my first week, week down there, when I was working on the locomotive, when I was a shunter, we were towing a locomotive that had a flat battery and an electrician was illegally riding on the coupling between the two locomotives. And we came to a bad piece of track work and at the same place, the arches had been reduced in size. And this electrician, a lad called Frank Egan, who was 24, uh, with two children, and he was thrown off and crushed to death against the, and that was in my first week down the pit. I was like six feet away from him and he was crushed against the sides. He, he wasn't killed instantly, his skull was cracked and he was 
uh, internal injuries and I was sent to get a stretcher but it was a couple of hours before they got him out of the pit and I remember it, the last thing he said was for God's sake get me out of this pit. The track men were sent down immediately to straighten this track out because it was defective and that was done before anybody come and did an inspection because after a serious accident there has to be an inspection everything has to be measured up but they came down and altered the track to how it should be before anybody got there. Now they used to play some tricks on you the lads did. Like you, you know if you, if you took your jacket off you, you have to be careful where you put your hands afterwards because if they found any mice or anything like that they stick them in your pocket. You know like dead mice. There's loads of mice down there. Coming off the timber and they'd live off your sandwiches. So you had to be careful where you put your sandwiches as well. If you left them what we call where the rings were, you know, where the, the tunnel, no tunnel rings were, and you just put them down there, the mice would just eat through it. So you'd, you'd go for your sandwich, and there'd be a big bloody hole in them, where the mice would be. So, what, what were these strikes? The two strikes you're talking about? Well, they, they, were, they were because the coal board had promised that they would fetch wages up to the mm. previous level, yeah. and they never did. We never got up to 30 or 40 pounds a week, which was a lot of money, and that was the cause of the, of the 72 and 74 strikes. The coal board's reluctance to give what they promised in the first place. So we've been like six years on rubbish money, you know, for the man who didn't work all the time, it was six years of rubbish money, and it wasn't getting any better. In 1974, dustbin men were getting more money than coal miners. Tell you the truth, I, I never went on a picket. I weren't really interested. I was only a young kid, so I was more interested in girls and stuff like that. <laughs> Going on picket lines. Sometimes they could be quite rough, these people, you know, on the picket lines. Especially if there were scabs, you know, going through, you know, trying to break the strike and all that, you know, they were pretty ruthless. Because I never crossed it. I never crossed the picket line. I wouldn't do it to this day. It didn't affect me as much as it did my dad. Obviously, because I was living with dad at the time. And, you know, I was only a young lad and I, I like, wasn't getting much money, if anything. But um, dad made sure there'd be food on the table. He had to take a job, a very poorly paid one, you know, cash in hand. And he shot a few hairs and stuff, and, and uh, he used to go out hunting, bring some food back for us. I mean, that's incredible, yeah. So we had, uh, we lived on rabbit and stuff, and like, whatever we could get. I know that we had a lot of support as well in, in the community and everything. And whenever the miners got a rise, you know, generally other people got rises. The miners' union was the main union of the trade union congress, right? You know what I mean? It was the battering ram of the trade union congress.